This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Today, we'll be conversing with the new National Director for Black and Pink Organization based in Boston. Her name is Trey Jones. I first met Trey in Honolulu back in January of this year during the Women's March at the State Capitol. I have hoped that Trey would stay in the state of Aloha for many years, but we should sure need her wisdom and spunk here. I also have hoped that Trey would be able to give continuity to her social justice and advocacy work in our state. Destiny had bigger plans for her. Trey is now focusing her energy and sharing her expertise to support LGBTQIA prisoners and their families at the national level while addressing criminal justice reform issues as well. As a fast world nation, we know that reducing prison population, finding alternatives to incarceration and accounting for the human and fiscal toll of mass incarceration needs to happen in the United States. This is a bipartisan issue, and restorative justice is a much more humane, cost-efficient, and effective way to address and repair harms and violence and crimes. Some states are ahead of the curve and working towards moving in such direction. This conversation could not be more timing for the state of Hawaii, for we need effective incarceration policies now to improve Hawaii's current correctional system. On November 8, Governor Iggy announced a preferred location for the new building of Oahu Community Correctional Center, otherwise known as OCCC. It seems to be quite a rush decision, especially uh, given that the community at large does not wish to see the building of a new OCCC, and uh, HCR 85 Task Force must finish their work, which is not projected to happen until 2019, before any plans for OCCC move forward. Instead of spending billions of dollars building a larger OCCC, our state ought to consider repairing its current criminal justice system and spend money to adopt restorative justice models that focuses on rehabilitation and reintegration instead. The disproportionate overrepresentation of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in the Hawaiian criminal justice system is quite problematic and deserves special attention as well. Data from the Hawaii Department of Public Safety indicated that as of 2016, 38.4% of the prison population in the state of Hawaii were Native Hawaiians. That means that one out of four Native Hawaiians are in prison or jail. One out of three incarcerated people at OCCC were homeless. And more than 50% of the people detained at OCCC are pre-trial detainees. And as of July of 2016, 999 people or 72% of the people in prison at OCCC were classified at community or minimum custody level. From 1978 to 2014, the Hawaiian prison has increased 654%. Such increase is largely driven by heavier penalties from non-violent offenses. On that note, let's welcome Trey to our program. Hey, how you doing? Hi, Trey. Trey. How you doing? Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us here at Think Tech Hawaii. So, do you mind giving our viewers a little background about yourself? I know that you were raised in Chicago. So, what was life like growing up, my darling? Well, life growing up in Chicago in the late 80s, early 90s, it was different. I mean, we was poor, but I didn't realize how poor we was until I was an adult. You know, so it was... You know, growing up, family first. I left Chicago when I was 17. I joined the Navy. Um, after I was discharged from the Navy, um, I went to college. I studied pre-law. I was raising my sister's kids and my brother's kids. And then after I graduated from college, five days later, I was sentenced to 13 years in federal prison for less than $500 worth of drugs. I spent nine years in federal prison, becoming a very good jailhouse lawyer, assisting a lot of women with their cases, with custody battles and things like that. And then upon my release, at first I was an engineer, 
And then I started doing advocacy work and just doing what I love because even though I was a certified welder, every job I had never worked out for me. So, so it was destined for me to do this advocacy work because no matter what the job was, I mean, I could be getting paid $25 an hour and I wanted to just help somebody get out of prison. So your call really comes from the heart, from first-hand experience, not only in having to deal with an unjust criminal justice system, but also finding niches and ways to ameliorate the system and to empower all the individuals to fight for their own rights. True. In that, so Trey, tell me a little bit about um, what is life now for you in Boston, uh, since you took your new position as uh, the national director for Black and Pink, like what are you up to? Well, the prospect of life here in Boston as the national director is amazing. You know, there's amazing opportunities and there's amazing work that can be done here. I've worked not only with, with Black and Pink, but I'm familiar with a couple of different organizations here, starting up like the Women's Justice Circle, you know, but uh, Black and Pink is now getting into reentry. So instead of just supporting the Pen Pal program, uh, we have reentry programs we're trying to start up now to support LGBTQ and HIV positive prisoners when they're released. So they have the resources like healthcare providers, safe neighborhoods to live in, um, uh, LGBTQ friendly uh, mental health counseling and things like that. So just basically try to build a community. That's wonderful. So uh, do you mind sharing with our viewers um, when did Black and Pink uh started you know in the united states and how many chapters you have uh, and uh, you kind of touched a little bit on the uh, vision and mission uh, of the organization which is to serve uh, lgbt and hiv uh, uh, prisoners and their families uh, not only when they are reintegrated into society after they complete their term but also while they are uh, serving their sentence. So can you elaborate a well, little bit more on that? Black and Pink started in 2005. The founder was Jason Lydon. He was, um, he was released from federal prison and he decided to keep in contact with his uh, friends that he left behind. That turned into one of the largest pen pal programs in the country. We also have a newspaper that goes out to 15,000 prisoners every single month. Mm -hmm. uh, we do court support. Uh, and basically, you know, we, we advocate for trans prisoners and LGBTQ prisoners to end solitary confinement mm -hmm. to, because sexual violence, sexual assault, is most prevalent among LGBTQ and trans prisoners. They're, they're brutalized in men's prisons by guards and inmates alike. And so we we take, you know, we, we hold pr prisons and jails accountable when we have our members complain to us and basically we just advocate for human rights. But our vision and our mission is the end of prison industrial complex itself in the whole because it is a failed entity and it has been shown historically over and over again that prison and the concept the concept that it is used in today is failed exactly so let's elaborate a little bit more on this failed system that uh, uh, you have just mentioned uh, and the trend that, that we have in our nation to support more of that privatization, federal money to support a, a punitive a criminal justice system as opposed to a restorative one. Um, how is Black and Pink uh, engaged to uh, 
educate people you know, about the issues, but also to advocate for that change. We, we do a lot of workshops. We do workshops that we train professionals like public defenders. We train uh, doctors, healthcare providers in how to treat formerly incarcerated LGBTQ. We also were instrumental in doing policy and research. Uh, we had the, we had a study called Coming Out of Concrete Closet. It was the largest LGBTQ study of active prisoners done. And I mean, that, that study itself gave so much information because it was over 1,200 respondents all over the country, state and federal prisons. And we, we just got a wealth of information. And what Black and Pink is dedicated to doing is ensuring that the laws and policy that we work so hard to put in place are, are implemented. Mm -hmm. Like right now in, in Massachusetts, we're working on solitary confinement bill and it states, you know, if an LGBTQ person is in or trans person is in solitary confinement for their safety, there's not only a time limit, but they have to be afforded with the same privileges. And at this present time, Black and Pink is, you know, making a case for being on that oversight committee as opposed to having someone from the governor's office or the sheriff's office dictating how long a person that they really don't care about has to sit, sit in solitary confinement. So we've just been instrumental as while, while we tear down the prison industrial complex that we, in the interim, we do the necessary work to make sure people are treated the way that they should be treated. Absolutely. And uh, do you, as an organization, have a hard time uh, having access to prisoners, you know, who um, feel safe enough to share what the reality is? Because, like, one of the concerns that I think a lot of uh, social justice organizations have uh, when doing this level of advocacy work uh, is the fear of retaliation, you know, for inmates who are currently uh, serving their term and as they speak out, um, things start happening for them and not in a good way. So what is the experience of uh, black and pink in Massachusetts and in all the uh, states where you have chapters? Well, for the, for, the mo for the most part, our LGBTQ people and trans people know that they're already being brutalized. They're already being beaten and they're already being raped. And beating them and raping them and brutalizing them more is not going to change anything. So not almost every piece of prison, every piece of litigation that has gone through our Supreme Court has been brought on by a prisoner. It has been brought on by somebody sitting in a cell willing to take that backlash, willing to take that solitary confinement, willing to take those beatings, you know, those uh, rapes or sexual assaults to put their name on that lawsuit to fight the injustices of the prison system. So when our trans and LGBTQ people come to us, they already know the uh, violence that they're going to face because they're facing it anyway. Mm -hmm. So we have that, that level to where we understand the retaliation mm -hmm. and our people come ready because they're being hurt and beaten anyway. Mm -hmm. So they're going to hurt and beat us anyway, so we might as well fight. What a fresh uh, whiff of air to be able to have an organization that uh, can be um, a safe point uh, for people that are being abused and their human rights are being violated to say no more and I'm going to speak out against it and provide my testimony because that's a big part, I think, of systemic changes is that the people who are directly impacted by current policy, uh, the good and bad and ugly of policies, never have that space on the table or stake in terms of uh, having their voices and their experiences heard. It's always own organization, it's always experts speaking on behalf of a certain group 
an interest group on that. I really uh, commend uh, and value uh, the structure of your organization, that it is grassroots driven, but also driven by and for the people who are directly impacted by the injustices that they're currently faced with. So, um, wow, so, that, so that's a big, big, big thing, you know, happening right there. So uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the older uh, programs of uh, Black and Pink, uh, the art piece of it, and uh, um, the advocacy piece of it, because I understand that you also uh, provide the advocacy to individuals when they go to court. Uh, for their hearings or their parole reviews, how does that look like, and uh, how does Black and well, we, Pink? We have we have volunteers, and they they do court support. We identify LGBTQ people that need to be bonded out of jail, mm -hmm. and we go bond them out of jail, and we find out when their court dates are, and we go to court and support them. You know, we make sure that they have transportation to court, make sure that they have a safe haven. You know, we've been, we make sure, you know, that they eat, you know, that they have the basic things necessary to make it to court, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we stand there with them, you know, at, in, in, in place of their family, if they don't have a family, you know, and right now, Black and Pink, we're trying to um, get into a participatory defense to where we can be more active and we can help them become more active and also reach out to their families so that they can become more active in their own defense. Because, I mean, it, studies have shown that defendants with family and knowledge of their case and that actually took the time to help themselves, they, they get lesser sentences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And uh, so, much, so much of the clients that you see are people who have court-appointed attorneys, like a public defender. How is that looking like uh, in terms of uh, efficiency, uh, in terms of how that's uh, translated into fair representation, at least in Massachusetts? Well, I mean, I've, I've only been in Massachusetts a couple of months, so I can't really speak to the, you know, the record of the public defenders with a lot of intelligence. Mm -hmm. But I do know that we have been, we have a workshop training set up for the public defender's office here in Boston. Mm -hmm. They have been receptive to our volunteers, and they're also receptive to the participatory defense. So we're fortunate enough to have some public defenders that are willing to allow people to come in to assist them with their caseloads that's impossible for them to even treat half of their cases with any sort of attention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so much so. of uh, law has to do with that preparation, you know, like looking at the discovery, being able to do additional investigative work if necessary. And uh, as you have uh, pointed out, I think it's a national trend that the, most of our public defense uh, system, in any state you look at it, you know, are overworked and uh, that the resources are not there, you know, to be able to provide uh, that level of uh, uh, justice and, and equity, you know. So perhaps, you know, a lot of uh, the outcome of a sentence, you know, is determined uh, because, you know, that work, you know, needed to be a little bit more expanded. So that's really wonderful that uh, the public defenders in Boston are receptive to look at that and uh, work in partnership uh, with uh, Black and White. Are you guys working with the universities also and with uh, legal law centers to uh, be able to perhaps address this as a coalition? Well, we, we, we have a group, we have a couple of groups here in Boston. I'm trying to familiarize myself as I navigate through the nonprofit quagmire that they have here. You know, they have a lot of amazing organizations, but it's like a lot of amazing people are doing amazing work, but they're not doing the work together. So, 
like I uh, team up with the Massachusetts Bail Fund. We work, we work together, and we're trying to incorporate diversion programs. So if we can manage to get people out of their court situations, we can keep them. Right. To see, instead instead of trying to focus on making sure people go to court and prepare themselves to go to prison, we need to start focusing on keeping people out of prison and when they get out, keep them out so they can stay out. Exactly. Yeah. So. And that's the part of restorative justice uh, core that I think we have all over, you know, instead of having people deeper into, into the system that... You know, we really work to rehabilitate and to reintegrate and uh, keep them out of jail. Um, so what is that looking like for Boston in terms of, for example, uh, current uh, legislative work that would look at bail reform or alternative to incarcerations, for example, for people who pose low or no risk to society you know, for the crime that they might have committed? Well, Boston literally is kicking down doors because we have the Primary Caretakers Act that we've been, and it's, it's sort of like a diversion program, whereas if you're the primary caretaker of a minor child, you know, they need to offer something else instead of incarceration. Mm -hmm. So we've been trying to put that forward. Uh, Massachusetts Boston is also coming up with the Women's Justice Circle mm -hmm. and it's patterned after uh, the women's court in India. And basically it's, it's give us our women and girls and we'll take care of them. You don't have to put them in a cage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, determining the dynamics of that and try to see how we can fit that into the criminal justice system here in Boston. So, uh, and we, we have we have a lot with the criminal justice bail reform or with the reform bill itself, we have a lot of new policies going through that we're hoping are uh, adopted with this new bail fund, you know. Um, so right now, Boston is, they, they, they kicking butt over here trying to pave the way because we got some sisters over here that's, they're not playing no game, taking no prisoners. It's the women-led mm -hmm. organizations over here that are taking the lead Tell in making it happen. Tell me more about that women-led uh, movement that's mobilizing and shifting the way criminal justice is being done in Boston. What have you noticed you know, from women leadership in that call for change? Well, a struggle. I have I have personally firsthand witnessed the uh I'm trying to find the perfect word, the terrified white male that they're going to lose their place to these women. I mean, I've literally watched them become afraid of their position in these organizations and in the world. I mean, it's like white privilege feels attacked and threatened because these women-led organizations have done everything that should have been done in the last few years. Mm -hmm. I was asked a question uh, at Simmons College by a middle-aged white lady. She said that she has an unrealistic sense of being a progressive, liberal white woman but there are no black people in her town, so she don't know. So she asked me what could she do to support, you know, the movement and the fight to end white supremacy. Mm -hmm. and, and my answer has become this, and it's simply this, and it's pay black women. Pay black women for the plight that we have put and the time and the blood and the sweat and the tears that we have put into America. We have put our sons down from the trees. We are the first ones at the jail. We're the first ones to protest. If you shoot our kids in the street, black women are the first ones to show up. We were the only ones nursing white babies from our breast. We have nursed and cared for this country. And we owe it. 
and this country owes it to black women because after we put our kids on the bus, we go protest. We take care of this country. We have been taking care of this country since they brought us over here. And the, the way to support ending white supremacy is support black women because we have a reason to be doing this work and we're not doing it for the fame and the fortune. That's for sure. I can't, I don't think I can add anything uh, to this statement that you made and I can't believe how quickly our half an hour have passed and uh, I hope that this is the first of many dialogues that we'll be able to have uh, moving forward for months, years to come. I have told you many times uh, in your short stay here in Hawaii how much you have inspired me as a servant leader and as a sister, you know, to continue to walk in, in this field and to learn and to listen, more importantly to listen and to build the sisterhood uh, as it should be. Uh, and I, I, I can't believe, uh, you know, how lucky uh, and, and how timely it is that uh, you uh, went to Boston to exercise, you know, your new role. And uh, I'm so excited to not only follow your blossoming as a professional and as an advocate, uh, but also to figure out ways in which we can tie your work uh, at a national level here in Hawaii. You have so much to teach us and to share, and, and this exchange needs to happen. So I really want to thank you from the heart, you know, for your inner fire, for your energy, and uh, for your perseverance uh, and for giving so much of yourself. I'm happy that the other jobs did not work because this is exactly where you need to be. And uh, you, know, you know that you always have a sister here and uh, that Hawaii will always welcome you with open hearts. At least I think that Hawaii. <laughs> and uh, I will kick the door open for all the <laughs> other places, you know, to have, uh, you know, your voice uh, and the organization's presence uh, strong also here. Thank you so much, Trey. Thank you, Beatrice, and we'll, we'll be back to see you. We, we got lunch. Well, lovely couch is waiting for you and your wife. <laughs> Aloha, my darling. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. And this concludes um, our episode of uh, Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, I hope to see you next Friday. And I wish you all a wonderful Thanksgiving. Ahoi ho.